Section 5 After two hours' thought and care, during which Eugenie jumped up twenty times from her work to see if the coffee were boiling or to go and listen to the noise her cousin made in dressing, she succeeded in preparing a simple little breakfast, very inexpensive, but which nevertheless departed alarmingly from the inveterate customs of the house. The midday breakfast was always taken standing. Each took a slice of bread, a little fruit or some butter, and a glass of wine. As Eugenie looked at the table drawn up near the fire with an armchair placed before her cousin's plate, at the two dishes of fruit, the egg cup, the bottle of white wine, the bread, and the sugar heaped up in a saucer, she trembled in all her limbs at the mere thought of the look her father would give her if he should come in at that moment. She glanced often at the clock to see if her cousin could breakfast before the master's return. "'Don't be troubled, Eugenie. If your father comes in, I will take it all upon myself,' said Madame Grandet. Eugenie could not repress a tear. "'Oh, my good mother,' she cried, "'I have never loved you enough.' Charles, who had been tramping about his room for some time, singing to himself, now came down. Happily, it was only eleven o'clock. The true Parisian he had put as much dandyism into his dress as if he were in the chateau of the noble lady then travelling in Scotland. He came into the room with the smiling, courteous manner so becoming to youth, which made Eugenie's heart beat with mournful joy. He had taken the destruction of his castles in Anjou as a joke, and came up to his aunt gaily. "'Have you slept well, dear aunt?' and you too my cousin very well monsieur did you said madame grandet i perfectly you must be hungry cousin said eugenie will you take your seat i never breakfast before midday i never get up till then however i fared so badly on the journey that i am glad to eat something at once besides here he pulled out the prettiest watch breguet ever made dear me i am early it is only eleven o'clock early said madame grandet yes but i wanted to put my things in order well i shall be glad to have anything to eat anything it doesn't matter what a chicken a partridge holy virgin exclaimed nanon overhearing the words a partridge whispered eugenie to herself she would gladly have given the whole of her little hoard for a partridge come and sit down said his aunt the young dandy let himself drop into an easy chair, just as a pretty woman falls gracefully upon a sofa. Eugenie and her mother took ordinary chairs and sat beside him, near the fire. "'Do you always live here?' said Charles, thinking the room uglier by daylight than it had seemed the night before. "'Always,' answered Eugenie, looking at him, except during the vintage. Then we go and help Nanon and live at the Abbe des Noyers don't you ever take walks sometimes on sunday after vespers when the weather is fine said madame grandet we walk on the bridge or we go and watch the haymakers have you a theatre go to the theatre exclaimed madame grandet see a play why monsieur don't you know it is a mortal sin see here monsieur said nanon bringing in the eggs here are your chickens in the shell oh fresh eggs said charles who like all people accustomed to luxury had already forgotten about his partridge that is delicious now if you will give me the butter my good girl butter then you can't have the galette then i'll bring the butter cried eugenie the young girl watched her cousin as he cut his sippets with as much pleasure as a grisette takes in a melodrama where innocence and virtue triumph Charles, brought up by a charming mother, improved and trained by a woman of fashion, had the elegant, dainty, foppish movements of a coxcomb. The compassionate sympathy and tenderness of a young girl possess a power that is actually magnetic, so that Charles, finding himself the object of the attentions of his aunt and cousin, could not escape the influence of feelings which flowed towards him, as it were, and inundated him he gave eugenie a bright caressing look full of kindness a look which seemed itself a smile he perceived as his eyes lingered upon her 
the exquisite harmony of features in the pure face the grace of her innocent attitude the magic clearness of the eyes where young love sparkled and desire shone unconsciously ah my dear cousin if you were in full dress at the opera i assure you my aunt's words would come true you would make the men commit the mortal sin of envy and the women the sin of jealousy the compliment went to eugenie's heart and set it beating though she did not understand its meaning oh cousin she said you are laughing at a poor little country girl if you knew me my cousin you would know that i abhor ridicule it withers the heart and jars upon all my feelings here he swallowed his buttered sippet very gracefully no i really have not enough mind to make fun of others and doubtless it is a great defect in paris when they want to disparage a man they say he has a good heart the phrase means the poor fellow is as stupid as a rhinoceros but as i am rich and known to hit the bull's-eye at thirty paces with any kind of pistol and even in the open fields ridicule respects me my dear nephew that bespeaks a good heart you have a very pretty ring said eugenie is there any harm in asking to see it charles held out his hand after loosening the ring and eugenie blushed as she touched the pink nails of her cousin with the tips of her fingers see mamma what beautiful workmanship my there's a lot of gold said nanon bringing in the coffee what is that exclaimed charles laughing as he pointed to an oblong pot of brown earthenware glazed on the inside and edged with a fringe of ashes from the bottom of which the coffee grounds were bubbling up and falling in the boiling liquid it is boiled coffee said nanon ah my dear aunt i shall at least leave one beneficent trace of my visit here you are indeed behind the age i must teach you to make good coffee in a chaptal coffee-pot he tried to explain the process of a chaptal coffee-pot gracious if there are so many things as all that to do said nanon we may as well give up our lives to it i shall never make coffee that way i know that pray who is to get the fodder for the cow while i make the coffee i will make it said eugenie child said madame grandet looking at her daughter the word recalled to their minds the sorrow that was about to fall upon the unfortunate young man the three women were silent and looked at him with an air of commiseration that caught his attention is anything the matter my cousin he said hush said madame grandet to eugenie who was about to answer you know my daughter that your father charged us not to speak to monsieur say charles said young grandet ah you are called charles what a beautiful name cried eugenie presentiments of evil are almost always justified at this moment nanon madame grandet and eugenie who had all three been thinking with a shudder of the old man's return heard the knock whose echoes they knew but too well there's papa said eugenie she removed the saucer filled with sugar leaving a few pieces on the tablecloth nanon carried off the egg-cup madame grandet sat up like a frightened hare it was evidently a panic which amazed charles who was wholly unable to understand it why what is the matter he asked my father has come answered eugenie well what of that Monsieur Grandet entered the room, threw his keen eye upon the table, upon Charles, and saw the whole thing. Ha ha! So you have been making a feast for your nephew. Very good, very good, very good indeed, he said, without stuttering. When the cat's away, the mice will play. Feast, thought Charles, incapable of suspecting or imagining the rules and customs of the household. Give me my glass, Nanon, said the master eugenie brought the glass grandet drew a horn-handled knife with a big blade from his breeches pocket cut a slice of bread took a small bit of butter spread it carefully on the bread and ate it standing at this moment charles was sweetening his coffee pere grandet saw the bits of sugar looked at his wife who turned pale and made three steps forward he leaned down to the poor woman's ear and said where did you get all that sugar nanon fetched it from fessard's there was none 
it is impossible to picture the profound interest the three women took in this mute scene nanon had left her kitchen and stood looking into the room to see what would happen charles having tasted his coffee found it bitter and glanced about for the sugar which grandet had already put away what do you want said his uncle the sugar put in more milk answered the master of the house your coffee will taste sweeter eugenie took the saucer which grandet had put away and placed it on the table looking calmly at her father as she did so most assuredly the parisian woman who held a silken ladder with her feeble arms to facilitate the flight of her lover showed no greater courage than eugenie displayed when she replaced the sugar upon the table the lover rewarded his mistress when she proudly showed him her beautiful bruised arm and bathed every swollen vein with tears and kisses till it was cured with happiness charles on the other hand never so much as knew the secret of the cruel agitation that shook and bruised the heart of his cousin crushed as it was by the look of the old miser you are not eating your breakfast wife the poor helot came forward with a piteous look cut herself a piece of bread and took a pear eugenie boldly offered her father some grapes saying taste my preserves papa my cousin you will eat some will you not i went to get these pretty grapes expressly for you if no one stops them they will pillage saumur for you nephew when you have finished we will go into the garden i have something to tell you which can't be sweetened eugenie and her mother cast a look on charles whose meaning the young man could not mistake what is it you mean uncle since the death of my poor mother at these words his voice softened no other sorrow can touch me my nephew who knows by what afflictions god is pleased to try us said his aunt ta 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 said grandet there's your nonsense beginning i am sorry to see those white hands of yours nephew and he showed the shoulder of mutton fists which nature had put at the end of his own arms there's a pair of hands made to pick up silver pieces you've been brought up to put your feet in the kid out of which we make the purses we keep our money in a bad lookout very bad what do you mean uncle i'll be hanged if i understand a single word of what you are saying come said grandet the miser closed the blade of his knife with a snap drank the last of his wine and opened the door my cousin take courage the tone of the young girl struck terror to charles's heart and he followed his terrible uncle a prey to disquieting thoughts eugenie her mother and nanon went into the kitchen moved by irresistible curiosity to watch the two actors in the scene which was about to take place in the garden where at first the uncle walked silently ahead of the nephew grandet was not at all troubled at having to tell charles of the death of his father but he did feel a sort of compassion in knowing him to be without a penny and he sought for some phrase or formula by which to soften the communication of that cruel truth you have lost your father seemed to him a mere nothing to say fathers die before their children but you are absolutely without means all the misfortunes of life were summed up in those words grandet walked round the garden three times the gravel crunching under his heavy step in the crucial moments of life our minds fasten upon the locality where joys or sorrows overwhelm us charles noticed with minute attention the box borders of the little garden the yellow leaves as they fluttered down the dilapidated walls the gnarled fruit trees picturesque details which were destined to remain forever in his memory blending eternally by the mnemonics that belong exclusively to the passions with the recollections of this solemn hour it is very fine weather very warm said grandet drawing a long breath yes uncle but why well my lad answered his uncle i have some bad news to give you your father is ill then why am i here said charles nanon he cried order post-horses i can get a carriage somewhere he added turning to his uncle who stood motionless horses and carriages are useless answered grandet looking at charles 
who remained silent his eyes growing fixed yes my poor boy you guess the truth he is dead but that's nothing there is something worse he blew out his brains my father yes but that's not the worst the newspapers are all talking about it here read that grandet who had borrowed the fatal article from cruchot thrust the paper under his nephew's eyes the poor young man still a child still at an age when feelings wear no mask burst into tears that's good thought grandet his eyes frightened me he'll be all right if he weeps that is not the worst my poor nephew he said aloud not noticing whether charles heard him that is nothing you will get over it but never never my father oh my father he has ruined you you haven't a penny what does that matter my father where is my father his sobs resounded horribly against those dreary walls and reverberated in the echoes the three women filled with pity wept also for tears are often as contagious as laughter charles without listening further to his uncle ran through the court and up the staircase to his chamber where he threw himself across the bed and hid his face in the sheets to weep in peace for his lost parents the first burst must have its way said grandet entering the living-room where eugenie and her mother had hastily resumed their seats and were sewing with trembling hands after wiping their eyes but that young man is good for nothing his head is more taken up with the dead than with his money eugenie shuddered as she heard her father's comment on the most sacred of all griefs from that moment she began to judge him charles's sobs though muffled still sounded through the sepulchral house and his deep groans which seemed to come from the earth beneath only ceased towards evening after growing gradually feebler poor young man said madame grandet fatal exclamation pere grandet looked at his wife at eugenie and at the sugar-bowl he recollected the extraordinary breakfast prepared for the unfortunate youth and he took a position in the middle of the room listen to me he said with his usual composure i hope that you will not continue this extravagance madame grandet i don't give you my money to stuff that young fellow with sugar my mother had nothing to do with it said eugenie it was i who is it because you are of age said grandet interrupting his daughter that you choose to contradict me remember eugenie father the son of your brother ought to receive from us ta 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 exclaimed the cooper on four chromatic tones the son of my brother this my nephew that charles is nothing at all to us he hasn't a farthing his father has failed and when this dandy has cried his fill off he goes from here i won't have him revolutionize my household what is failing father asked eugenie to fail answered her father is to commit the most dishonorable action that can disgrace a man it must be a great sin said madame grandet and our brother may be damned there there don't begin with your litanies said grandet shrugging his shoulders to fail eugenie he resumed is to commit a theft which the law unfortunately takes under its protection people have given their property to guillaume grandet trusting to his reputation for honor and integrity he has made away with it all and left them nothing but their eyes to weep with a highway robber is better than a bankrupt the one attacks you and you can defend yourself he risks his own life but the other in short charles is dishonored the words rang in the poor girl's heart and weighed it down with their heavy meaning upright and delicate as a flower born in the depths of a forest she knew nothing of the world's maxims of its deceitful arguments and specious sophisms she therefore believed the atrocious explanations which her father gave her designedly concealing the distinction which exists between an involuntary failure and an intentional one father could you not have prevented such a misfortune my brother did not consult me besides he owes four millions what is a million father she asked 
with the simplicity of a child which thinks it can find out at once all that it wants to know a million said grandet why it is a million pieces of twenty sous each and it takes five twenty sous pieces to make five francs dear me cried eugenie how could my uncle possibly have had four millions is there any one else in france who ever had so many millions pere grandet stroked his chin smiled and his wen seemed to dilate but what will become of my cousin charles he's going off to the west indies by his father's request and he will try to make his fortune there has he got the money to go with i shall pay for his journey as far as yes as far as nantes eugenie sprang into his arms oh father how good you are she kissed him with a warmth that almost made grandet ashamed of himself for his conscience galled him a little will it take much time to amass a million she asked look here said the old miser you know what a napoleon is well it takes fifty thousand napoleons to make a million mamma we must say a great many nevens for him i was thinking so said madame grandet that's the way always spending my money cried the father do you think there are francs on every bush at this moment a muffled cry more distressing than all the others echoed through the garrets and struck a chill to the hearts of eugenie and her mother nanon go upstairs and see that he does not kill himself said grandet now then he added looking at his wife and daughter who had turned pale at his words no nonsense you two i must leave you i have got to see about the dutchmen who are going away to-day and then i must find cruchot and talk with him about all this he departed as soon as he had shut the door eugenie and her mother breathed more freely until this morning the young girl had never felt constrained in the presence of her father but for the last few hours every moment wrought a change in her feelings and ideas mamma how many louis are there in a cask of wine your father sells his from a hundred to a hundred and fifty francs sometimes two hundred at least so i've heard say then papa must be rich perhaps he is but monsieur cruchot told me he bought froidfond two years ago that may have pinched him eugenie not being able to understand the question of her father's fortune stopped short in her calculations he didn't even see me the darling said nanon coming back from her errand he stretched out like a calf on his bed and crying like the madeleine and that's a blessing what's the matter with the poor dear young man let us go and console him mamma if any one knocks we can come down madame grandet was helpless against the sweet persuasive tones of her daughter's voice eugenie was sublime she had become a woman the two with beating hearts went up to charles's room the door was open the young man heard and saw nothing plunged in grief he only uttered inarticulate cries how he loves his father said eugenie in a low voice in the utterance of those words it was impossible to mistake the hopes of a heart that unknown to itself had suddenly become passionate madame grandet cast a mother's look upon her daughter and then whispered in her ear take care you will love him love him answered eugenie ah if you did but know what my father said to monsieur cruchot charles turned over and saw his aunt and cousin i have lost my father my poor father if he had told me his secret troubles we might have worked together to repair them my god my poor father i was so sure i should see him again that i think i kissed him quite coldly sobs cut short the words we will pray for him said madame grandet resign yourself to the will of god cousin said eugenie take courage your loss is irreparable therefore think only of saving your honour with the delicate instinct of a woman who intuitively puts her mind into all things even at the moment when she offers consolation eugenie sought to cheat her cousin's grief by turning his thoughts inward upon himself my honour exclaimed the young man tossing aside his hair with an impatient gesture as he sat up on his bed and crossed his arms ah that is true 
my uncle said my father had failed he uttered a heart-rending cry and hid his face in his hands leave me leave me cousin my god my god forgive my father for he must have suffered sorely there was something terribly attractive in the sight of this young sorrow sincere without reasoning or afterthought it was a virgin grief which the simple hearts of eugenie and her mother were fitted to comprehend and they obeyed the sign charles made them to leave him to himself they went downstairs in silence and took their accustomed places by the window and sewed for nearly an hour without exchanging a word eugenie had seen in the furtive glance that she cast about the young man's room that girlish glance which sees all in the twinkling of an eye the pretty trifles of his dressing-case his scissors his razors embossed with gold this gleam of luxury across her cousin's grief only made him the more interesting to her possibly by way of contrast never before had so serious an event so dramatic a sight touched the imaginations of these two passive beings hitherto sunk in the stillness and calm of solitude mamma said eugenie we must wear mourning for my uncle your father will decide that answered madame grandet they relapsed into silence eugenie drew her stitches with a uniform motion which revealed to an observer the teeming thoughts of her meditation the first desire of the girl's heart was to share her cousin's mourning <laughs> 